Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this Monday afternoon. My name is Holly Parker. I'm a solo practitioner with HMP Law in Century City. Um, on behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Association and the litigation section chaired by Rudolph Lair, we'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon for an invigorating program titled Website Accessibility, Both Sides of the Story. Before we get started, we want to um, go over some housekeeping items. Um, the program materials you should have received in a link from the Beverly Hills Bar Association. And uh, that link will be reposted in the chat in the event you did not receive it. MCLE certificates will be emailed to each of you individually um, following the program. And if you do not receive them, please contact the BHBA and they will make sure that you get your, um, your appropriate credit for today's program. So without further ado, we'd like to begin. Um, we have two great speakers today to present some incredible, important um, information to you um, that um, you will, will enjoy and hopefully apply in your uh, various practices. Uh, the first speaker is Matthew S. Kenefick. He is a partner at Jeffer Mangles Butler and Mitchell LLP. Matt's practice includes litigation and operational compliance. Matt has handled hundreds of accessibility litigations and website re re remediations, excuse me. Our next speaker is Azar Mozari. She is the founder and principal of Beverly Hills Trial Attorneys. Azar has extensive experience both at the trial and appellate levels in a number of civil litigation areas, including patent and business litigation, consumer protection, and class action. She has also handled numerous website accessibility and remediation cases. Um, so before Azar, Azar and Matthew begin, uh, if any of you have any questions during the program, um, please put your questions in the Q&A um, section. You'll see the button, I believe, at the top or the bottom of your screen. And um, at the conclusion of the program, we'll set aside um, some time to hopefully address as many questions as we can within the hour that we have for this program. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our speakers. And thank you again for joining us. Great. Thank you, Holly. <clears throat> so uh, for everybody's uh, purpose, uh, obviously, I'm Matt, and uh, I am generally a defendant or defense side uh, attorney on ADA matters. So <clears throat> in today's presentation, I will be giving you from the defense side perspective, I'll let Azar address uh, her perspective as well. I know everybody's anticipating that we're going to argue like cats and dogs throughout all of this, but I, I suspect that you're going to find is that we're on the same page on most issues. Um, and yes, in case anybody's wondering, that is a Peloton behind me. I am working from home. Uh, you may eventually hear some kids running around outside my office door, but that's just COVID. Um, and if you were wondering, my favorite Peloton trainer is Hannah Marie. Um, Azar? Uh, well, thanks, Matt. Um, as Matt mentioned, we want the format of the presentation to be a little bit more fluid. So we're each going to take turns going over some slides, but the other person may interject just to provide their specific perspective. Um, now, our goal in the next hour is to cover both some high level and some more detailed topics relating to website accessibility. Um, we wanna discuss the issues from both the plaintiff side and defense side, as we've mentioned. Um, we're gonna first go over the statutory framework for the ADA, um, specifically its application in California. Uh, we're going to then discuss what accessibility entails from both a visual and communication point of view. And we're going to discuss in greater detail some of the specifics about how to ensure accessibility, including on web reservation systems. And finally, we're going to end things with some of our take on emerging trends. Um, and if we have time, we'll also reserve um, a question and answer session at the end. Um, now, uh, the next slide. Let's start things off looking at the statutory framework of the ADA. 
Um, the ADA was is a federal law that was signed over 30 years ago, so back in 1990, and it's without dispute one of America's most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation. Um, as, it name, as its name specifies, it prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in all areas of life. Um, but to be protected by the ADA, one must have a disability. So there comes the question as to what a disability is. And that definition has been developed over the years and over the jurisprudence. Um, but basically, there must be a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a life activity, um, or the person has to have a history or record of such an impairment, or the person must be perceived as having such an impairment by others. Um, there is no set list of covered impairments, um, and the definition, definition, as I mentioned, is fluid and evolving. Um, for example, with the prevalence of COVID infections, long COVID is now a recognized impairment under certain circumstances. So going back to the ADA, um, it specifically prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities and covers five key areas. Most of you are probably aware and familiar with Title I relating to the prohibition of discrimination by employers um, based on disability. There's also a state and local government activity section, uh, public transportation and telecommunication section. But today our focus is going to be on the public accommodations prong, namely Title III. Um, and it's important to note that the scope of the ADA is expressly meant to be broadly construed and covers just about any facility that a member of the public can access. Um, next slide. Okay. So let me chime in real quick. Uh, the um, yeah, so I, I agree with Azar that uh, the primary focus is always ADL. Um, you know, daily life activities or activities of daily life um, <clears throat> on on a uh, accessibility issue. We we see that a lot. Um, it's definitely a remedial statute, which means that it's going to be construed broadly. Um, and even though I'm on the defense side, I'll be the first one to say that the ADA is a noble cause. Um, it's originated, uh, you know, in part to allow members of society to participate more. <clears throat> before ADA, um, before the ADA's enactment in 1992, we would see that, you know, a lot of people were having a hard time participating in society for a lot of reasons uh, because of their disabilities, whether it's physical access or policies, procedures that have a uh, discriminatory impact, even though they may be facially neutral. Uh, so the ADA is, is a noble cause intended to allow people who have so many challenges in their life already to be able to participate in our society. And that's a good thing. <clears throat> Obviously, the controversy is that the ADA has been perceived to have uh, to be abused by certain people. And the issue is, is the ADA is not self-executing, meaning that it doesn't just automatically happen, right? So they have an enforcement clause, just like many other civil rights uh, um, statutory schemes. The enforcement clause is a, is a plaintiff's attorney, or a plaintiff for that matter, can recover their legal fees associated with enforcing their rights. Um, we can, we'll talk about that in detail. But that, of course, um, has, in certain circumstances, um, incentivized enforcement and has attracted some abuse. Uh, I don't want to give too many war stories, but I can tell you one which is pretty egregious is there was one law firm uh, that literally filed thousands of cases throughout the country. And then it, in a case we were involved in, my firm was involved in in New Mexico, uh, it came to the judge's attention that the lawyers were actually shill lawyers being hired uh, by this law firm and everything was being ran out in Nevada uh, by a team of paralegals. And uh, the, the plaintiffs themselves were being recruited on job hiring sites 
and they were being shuttled around to manufacture these cases. Ultimately, attorney generals from certain states got involved, took over the cases. I know the New Mexico case, the, uh, the, the plaintiff's attorney or the, the local lawyer in that case did resign for, uh, from her state bar membership. So uh, that type of abuse in certain circumstances has definitely given rise to a lot of controversy. And that controversy obviously is probably why a lot of you are logged in. But uh, let me go ahead to the next slide. There we go. Thank you, Matt. Um, now, specifically under Title III of the ADA, public accommodations must have facilities that are accessible to individuals with disabilities. Um, and these facilities must make reasonable modifications to policies when necessary to ensure that individuals with disabilities have equal access to the same goods and services as others. Um, the places of public accommodation must also ensure effective communication with individuals with disabilities by providing them with certain aids and services at no additional charge as needed. Um, the definition of a place of public accommodation is again extensive. Um, it must be in broad strokes, a uh, private place affecting commerce and falling within um, at least one of the 12 categories that's expressly listed in the ADA. Um, now those 12 categories are so broad that um, it could be argued that they encompass every place um, that you can think of. So there's places of lodging, there's um, establishments serving food and drinks, places of entertainment, stadiums, movie theaters, concert halls, um, sales or rental establishments, grocery stores, shopping malls. And the, the specific topic of the presentation today, websites, um, is not expressly mentioned. So there is no express mention of a non-physical entity like a website or a mobile app in the ADA because we're talking about a law that was enacted in 1990. However, um, the 12 categories contain extremely broad catch-all language. So it's fairly clear um, that the ADA does cover websites. And I think Matt and I both agree on that, both from the plaintiff's perspective and defense counsel's perspective that um, the language is broad enough to encompass websites and mobile applications. Um, but the question that courts have been facing more and more over the years is whether or not a place of public accommodation can be a website alone, or must it be a website that's also tied to a physical location? Um, and we're gonna further explore that issue during this presentation, and you'll get our perspective from both sides. Absolutely. And I'll just add for the public accommodation issue, definitely that's a controversial subject. There's a lot of back and forth. The courts have struggled with this. Um, you know, I, I first started doing website accessibility. Um, I think the first article I published was in late 2001, 2002, and all the way up until the Target case in 2008, 2009, uh, District Court, uh, Ninth Circuit, we were, um, you know, everybody was under the assumption that um, the ADA did not apply um, to websites. Um, certainly the, the DOJ feels that it does. We've seen that in many briefs, but we've also seen the pendulum go back and forth. You'll see a lot of different, um, you'll see a lot of different case law ad addressing that. And we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, but of course it's come up in different contexts. Third circuit by way of example, the controlling case was dealing with whether or not a uh, uh, an insurance policy was a public accommodation, and that gets extended a lot to websites. But we do know in certain places like the Western District of Pennsylvania, the court will the district courts will unequivocally hold in most circumstances that it is a, a website is a public accommodation. Again, uh, you know, as Azar pointed out, it's a, it's a legislative lag issue. Um, you know, the effective date of uh, Title III was January 26, 1993. Um, certainly back then. Uh, people weren't thinking of websites. Um, so we definitely have, uh, have had some back and forth on that. Next slide. Um, so in addition to the general discrimination prohibition, uh, Title III also imposes various specific requirements 
to provide uh, reasonable modifications in procedure, policy, um, and practices to ensure equal access for individuals that have disabilities and everyone else. Um, so for example, this applies to allowing the entry of uh, individuals with service animals into various places of public accommodation. Um, as another example, in a store with a checkout aisle, um, there needs to be an adequate number of accessible checkout aisles that are kept open for individuals with physical disabilities. So there's sufficient room um, to navigate the physical space. Um, but there is an important defense uh, if a place of public accommodation is able to show that the modification is overly burdensome, such that it would fundamentally alter the nature of the goods or services offered. Um, that defense is alleged a lot of times, but to actually prove it um, is a completely different story. Um, as by way of an illustration, if you have a small private historic museum um, that's on a very small budget um, and providing tours that are open to the public, um, for them to re be required to provide a full-time sign language interpreter uh, may be argued to be uh, overly burdensome. Um, however, they can provide a written script of the tour. That uh, alternative uh, would not result in an undue burden. So that defense, as Matt can probably attest to, is oftentimes raised, but to actually establish the um, undue burden is harder than it sounds. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> so basically this is the catch-all, right? The policy procedures and practices. <clears throat> basically, when whenever something's not addressed. So when we look at certain types of issues in accessibility, we do have some pretty clear regulations. For physical access, we have the ADAG, which spells out a lot of very clear uh, guidelines and regulations, measurements. And this is these are measurements that have been in place and studied for many, many years. And we all know the ADAG it was updated uh, in 2010, effectively 2020, uh, 2012 rather, is when it went into place. But, um, <clears throat> but a lot of things we don't have regulations on. And a lot of things aren't, uh, aren't um, you know, aren't, you know, anticipated because you can't anticipate everything in the operation of a public accommodation. So that's what this catch-all is for. Now, of course, it needs to be a reasonable request. Certainly, certainly some requests are not going to be reasonable. Fundamental alteration is definitely one of the, the, the defenses to determining whether or not a request is reasonable. There is a process uh, for this as well, and that is the guest must make the request. Public accommodation should consider it, and they can either accept or reject it. Often, we the first request we'll get is in a lawsuit, and I don't. I, you know, obviously, the ADA does not require a pre-litigation notice, but at the same time, uh, making a request in a lawsuit, I don't think, is also consistent with the intent. Uh, and there's cases on that, the Anderson versus Ross case, even the uh, the Martin PGA case, once the United States Supreme Court uh, uh, addressed in some of the lower precedent this process that we have. Of, uh, <clears throat> of making requests first. Um, with regard to the ASL, the, the, uh, the sign language uh, interpreter, we'll go into that in a little bit more down the road as, as well, because that's, uh, that's the auxiliary aids and services that we're talking about. Uh, it's a whole different section, but we'll talk about that as well. But this, again, this is, this is the catch-all. <clears throat> so I've, I've spoken with a lot of people um, who've you know, you're on different sides of accessibility, whether they're regulators or, or uh, people, you know, working with justice, Department of Justice, or people who, uh, who work in the, uh, you know, in the field of doing measurements, you know, what we would consider consultants, and they've all, you know, unanimously come up with, well, if it's not covered, let's look at it under whether this is a policy modification issue. And so, so this is really the catch all that we usually see. Thanks, Matt. Um, so Title III, as Matt alluded to, also imposes the requirement that a place of public accommodation provide certain aids and services to disabled person as 
requested as necessary. Um, as Matt mentioned, the person that's impacted has to make a request for the aid or service and the operator of a place of public accommodation um, can determine whether or not it wants to comply with that request. Um, the nature of the aid or service provided in response to the request is decided by the operator. So the operator has a certain level of discretion in terms of what type of service or aid it wants to offer, if any. Um, and, and this again pertains to things such as you know qualified interpreters, television captioning, assistive listening headsets, braille materials, um, and the places of public accommodations um, should, if they opt to provide these services and aids, um, should not charge anything uh, for this additional service. Uh, now, in the context of websites, that aid can be in the form of accessible electronic and information technology. So digital content that is compatible to screen reader software, for example. And by that, we mean um, if you have content that's presented online, um, there must be a textual uh, representation that can then be read by way of either a text recognition software or screen reader software. Um, so the digital content is actually compatible with those software for individuals who are, for example, visually impaired. Um, also magnification software for individuals who are visually impaired but not totally blind and optical readers. Um, so that's in the context of website accessibility. And again, the same defense that we've alluded to exists here too. Um, specifically, if the aid that's requested is overly burdensome such that it would fundamentally alter the nature of the goods and services offered, um, then it's a full defense. Um, and in terms of quantifying that burden, there are a variety of factors that are considered um, to determine the scope and nature of the burden. Um, first of all, obviously, as uh, with any business decision, there's the nature and cost of the requested service or aid uh, that's examined, um, the overall financial resources of the operator, whether or not uh, complying with this request is even feasible from a financial perspective, um, and sometimes legitimate safety requirements that are necessary for the safe operation of the place of public accommodation. And as we'll later see in this presentation, um, this is an important uh, consideration uh, when we're talking about mask mandates, for example, and individuals who have disabilities who claim they cannot wear masks uh, as a result of that disability. But again, there's legitimate safety requirements that come into play. Um, so these are some of the factors that are considered uh, when, cons when the uh, undue burden defense is alleged. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, safety and security are definitely part of the undue burden uh, analysis. Um, you know, so for auxiliary aids and services, um, you know, this is a, this is actually a very common uh, uh, issue, and the reason it's part of this website is because this analytical framework is often applied to website accessibility or digital access uh, in general. Um, so one of the things that we've seen over the years that's really common was TRS. And that's tele, uh, telecommunications relay services. And what that is, that's a, uh, a service where somebody were to, uh, you know, who either has a speaking or a hearing disability, where they will use a, uh, they use a, a telecommunications relay service, which is provided by the FCC to real time communicate with a third party via the telephone. Um, and what happens is they're doing a video chat the, the person with disability is doing a video chat with the communications assistant. That's somebody who's provided uh, by the FCC through 711. And then what they'll do is they will contact the, the public accommodation and they'll try to communicate. Often we'll see you know, the, the person with disability either use a TTY, a teletype device, or they'll be doing ASL or other types of communicative um, measures with that person. And that's how they would communicate with a uh, 
<clears throat> with a, a channel of communication that's telephonic and, and basis. And we'll also see that occur you know, through digital, right? They'll do a, an online chat with the communications assistant. Um, we've seen the TRS definitely be a, an issue. A lot of DOJ enforcement in that about 10 years ago. Some law, law firms got hit on it too. Uh, some really uh, robust um, consent decrees resulted from that, which have some uh, pretty strong policies, practices, and procedures put in there. But the main issue about auxiliary aids and services is so for Title III, again, the public accommodation gets to choose how they do that. But the standard is effective communication. And so you think about it this way, by way of example, we talked about having a qualified uh, American Sign Language uh, interpreter, uh, possibly at li a live speaking event or a versus having real time captioning that's where some there's some captioning underneath the difference is you could imagine for a complicated financial transaction you're going to want to be communicating with that person with the disability um, or maybe a, a complicated educational seminar you want to communicate with them in their you know their first language asl is a different language in english so, so to achieve that effective communication, we look at that. Uh, we look at, are you provide, are you actually, is this a transaction that's going to require ASL versus real-time captioning? We can go through all these different things. We often see Braille statements. Uh, we, there was a, uh, a series of class action litigations um, in New York last, about two years ago, they started still going a little on appeal. I, I handled several of them and it was where um, the plaintiffs were seeking to require the public accommodations to provide a uh, provide gift cards with Braille and printing on it. <clears throat> there was some legal, there was some, there were some defects with the legal theories. First of all, the person buying a gift card is not the person using the gift card, right? So the person who really would have standing to assert the claim would need to be the person who was receiving uh, the gift card, and that person would actually have to have the disability and be a Braille reader. There are less and less Braille readers. A lot of people who are blind are not Braille readers. Um, a lot of people, you know, usually we see it more with the congenital blindness and also older generations because of the assistive technologies that exist out there. But we definitely saw that lawsuit or those series of lawsuits. I think about 300 of them were filed in class action format. I, again, I, I, I had several of them, um, which I got rid of. But let's go on to number slide number nine. Yeah, so California is the leading state in terms of the sheer number of Title III lawsuits filed. And I say that by a long shot. Um, the reason for this is because the UNRU Act exists. Um, and specifically, the UNRU Act affords plaintiffs who encounter a barrier a minimum of $4,000 in damages irrespective of whether or not um, there's proof of an actual injury. Um, and that's probably the main reason why Title III suits are so much more prevalent in California than in any other state. Um, and in terms of the sheer numbers, just to give everyone an idea, based on a very recent survey um, in terms of the number of lawsuits, federal, federally filed lawsuits in 2020, um, the, the survey came to uh, calculate that there were approximately 6,000 Title III lawsuits that were filed in federal court in California in 2020. Um, the next leading state in terms of lawsuits filed in 2020 was New York um, with a little more than 2,200 federal lawsuits. So that's a, sec that's a distant second um, if you think about it. And then the third, most popular state would be Florida with around uh, 1,200 federal lawsuits filed. Um, but again, these numbers preclude state filed lawsuits, which I would say are probably more popular than even the uh, federal lawsuits. So we're talking about a big, big number of lawsuits filed every single year. Um, and the reason why California is so popular uh, beyond the expansive remedies that the UNRU Act provides, it's also important to know that it incorporates by reference the ADA. So as a matter of statute, a violation of the ADA is a violation of uh, the UNRU Act. Um, and remedies for private parties that enforce it include 
injunctive relief and attorney's fees and costs. Um, so there's a lot to consider. Um, but that's not the only California disability law. Um, there's also the Disabled Persons Act. And that implies mainly, I would say, in construction-related accessibility cases, um, not generally to website accessibility cases. I think uh, the reason for that is that the statutory civil penalties were recently reduced um, to a maximum of three times the amount of actual damages, but no less than $4,000. But then for certain violations and under certain circumstances, it can be um, $1,000. Um, but because the Disabled Persons Act also affords reduced damages, if, for example, the defendant makes the required changes within a certain time period after it's provided notice, um, and there's additional requirements, it's not the main statute that we see cited um, in website accessibility cases. Um, now, private parties are not the only ones filing uh, or trying to enforce Title III uh, suits. It's important to note that if the Department of Justice uh, gets involved, uh, you need to pay attention because the assessed penalties are significant. We're talking about over $96,000 for a first violation and um, over 192,000 for a second violation, as well as injunctive relief and damages. Um, this means that for any client facing a DOJ action, it's imperative that it be taken very seriously and all attempts to resolve the matter informally be fully explored because there are uh, typically steps before the violations are assessed. And uh, it's important to take that very seriously. Yeah, so there's so much to say about this slide here, because um, this is obviously the driver of most litigation in California. I'd like to first point out that New York does have uh, damages provisions available as, where, as well, but they're $500. And you know, we have a civil uh, or a city, uh, you know, New York City and also New York State. Uh, Civil Rights Act um, damages, and um, you know, I I, ha I do handle work in New York and in Florida, and we do see a lot of accessibility work in both arenas. Um, about the UNRRA Act, first of all, the four thousand dollars it is a minimum. The highest I've seen was in a federal court in Orange County, um, Central District, uh, where it was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for one incident. That was a visual access uh, policies practices and procedures case uh, where it went to trial. And uh, basically it was a facially neutral discriminatory impact case where a uh, credit union did not want to uh, give loans to people who did not buy cars and keep the, t keep the cars themselves and have a driver's license. They didn't want people basically borrowing money for other people to buy cars. And this particular case was a blind individual who wanted to buy a car, finance it, and um, and have the um, and have his caretaker drive him around in it. They denied the loan. They stood behind it. It went to trial. They lost. Uh, <clears throat> but the uh, UNRRA Act damages they're not they're not you know they're not guaranteed. That's for sure. Um, we do note that uh, the term difficulty, discomfort, and embarrassment that is for physical access. That's under Civil Code fifty five fifty six, and that precedent has been interpreted by several courts to require some type of physical or emotional injury. Now, that doesn't apply for communicative access, such as website accessibility, but it's definitely there and it is a precedent. And you have to, and you have to think how a court's gonna to respond to somebody saying, look, I just clicked on a site. I really wasn't a customer. I went there because my lawyer told me to go there and I want my four grand minimum per damage. The deterred visit is also something that's very important. There's a, there's a movie theater case out there where uh, an individual said, I want to go to the movie theater every week for a whole year and I couldn't. I want all my damages. I want $4,000 damages for each time I would have went to the theater, but I knew about the, the accessibility barriers and the court bit and gave it to them. It's called a deterred visit. So it's not just an actual visit, but it's a deterred visit. The counterpoint to that is there's both a, a statutory and also a, a case law precedent that a plaintiff has a duty to mitigate their damages. It's not a novel concept. Everybody has to mitigate their damages. So you can't just keep going back 
over and over again to the same website uh, when you know it's not accessible and you have no reason to believe that it's been changed. Another reason you're probably not going to see a disabled person act uh, action is because the attorney's fees are bilateral. So there's California Supreme Court precedent on this, uh, where if you were to, it were a, a plaintiff filed a suit over a step in a small market in San Francisco, a step up to get in. They said, look, that could be readily achievable, right? meaning it had to be removed. And we won't go into the physical access standards. They said this should be removed under the ADA uh, and also the UNRRA Act, you know, 51F incorporates it. And, uh, but they sought attorney's fees in their prayer under the Disabled Persons Act. That was one of their, one of their requests. And so what happened was the trial court found that it wasn't readily achievable to remove that, uh, that step. And uh, the Court of Appeal and ultimately the Supreme Court affirmed. And as a result, the defense got their attorney's fees, six figures in attorney's fees. And I have obtained awards at district court, central district specifically, of defense of attorney's fees just to have them flipped on the ninth because the standard for a, a federal ADA case is it must be frivolous, unreasonable and without foundation. And you have to show that the fees are exclusively related to that specific frivolous claim. You know, obviously, in a, you know, some claims were, you know, have merit, some claims don't, you're gonna have a hard time with that. Whereas the Disabled Persons Act uh, defense of attorney's fees works the other way. And on the and one final note on the DOJ enforcement proceedings, which we've handled many, they, they often do refer you to uh, a mediation service. But if they're going to enforce and they're going to investigate, the first thing you get is an is a investigatory subpoena. And they say, look, you need to provide us a lot of information very quickly. And it's very, very difficult to comply with that because it's a deep reach and it's very expensive. And if I showed you some of these letters, they're not, you know, they're not confidential that we get that say well, the things that they want. It's you know, all communications regarding this or all, all requests for that. And if you have, let's say, a, a large financial institution, like some of the requests we've worked on, they have call centers that are taking 100 or 200 million calls a year. It's very difficult in two weeks to scour three or four years worth of records and get that information to them. So it's it, it, you know so the, the the justice investigation cannot be understated, and certainly uh, you know they do have a, a lot of power there. But uh, we've had some pretty good results with justice. So moving on to the next slide. And yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so I think the first question that comes up in how to assess the accessibility of a website uh, for an individual that's impaired is what is the standard or what guidelines and protocols do you refer to in trying to assess the accessibility? Um, well, there are certain standards that are routinely cited by both plaintiff's counsel and defense counsel. Um, and our interpretation of what those standards actually require may differ but it's pretty uh, undisputed that, you know, the, for example, the Web Content Accessibility Guideline or WCAG um, is one such standard that's routinely referred to. Um, just to give a very quick uh, background, because we, we are running out of time, um, it was developed by the World Wide Web Consortium uh, which is basically an international body comprised of experts in the field who put together these guidelines to ensure that for individuals who are visually impaired and need to use screen readers um, or text recognition software, the digital content is presented in a way that's being, um, I would say, translated in an accessible manner. Um, now, to give you some additional context, a screen reader is in broad spokes um, a software that basically reads out loud the, the website's textual content to a visually impaired user. So the visually impaired user can understand what is presented um, in a visually manner by reading the text that's presented. But to ensure that the websites are actually using methods that allow screen readers to read out all the required information and text, the WCAG standard um, is what should be consulted. Um, 
Now, WCAG is not a legal standard under Title III, and private businesses are not required by law to comply with any specific standard. What is required is that the website be equally accessible. Um, but because various courts and the DOJ um, have cited to compliance with WCAG as the main standard, it's definitely uh, the, the standard to consult. Um, the main foundational principles of WCAG um, are that any type of web content has to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust enough to be used by a range of assistive aids. Um, so a range of screen readers or text recognition software. Yeah, and so I would just uh, <clears throat> point out for WCAG, um, you know, it, it's, it's intended to address numerous disabilities, not just people who are blind, low vision, or have visual impairments. We definitely see it's also for cognitive disabilities, um, trying to deal with people who are help assist people who can't use a graphic interface, basically a mouse because of physical disabilities or impairments. We definitely have people who have hearing impairments as this addresses. So it's, it's, trying, it's trying to set forth a set of standards, a set of guidelines, um, you know, that's not just for websites, but for mobile content as well, which leads into the next slide, which which I'll lead on, and that is that it really is, you know, the the genesis, in my opinion, of this litigation, of the, the wave of litigation website accessibility. There is uncertainty in the standards, right? So we had an advanced notice proposed rulemaking from Justice that said, "Hey, look, we're going to uh, we're going to adopt the WCAG as a standard," and then on you know December 26, 2017, they withdrew it. They did put it forward in some of their adopted in some other contexts that didn't address public accommodations. We see the consent decrees and justice enforcement proceedings and also amicus briefs do address um, WCAG. They say it's a standard. We do have some district courts that have said WCAG is a standard. Out here in the Ninth Circuit, we, the, the controlling precedent that we see is the Robles Dominoes case, which most people are aware of, where basically, uh, the Ninth Circuit said, look, uh, WCAG can be a manifestation of noncompliance, and a court absolutely has in its equitable description um, that, that we are going to, uh, you know, be able to order somebody to comply or conform to WCAG. The issue is, is what is compliance or conformity with WCAG? There's a lot of different ways to measure that, right? Um, so I can have three different consultants look at the same website and they'll all come up with different results. An easy way to do it is automated testing, which gets a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. Azar can go on uh, on that as well, because I know she knows the testing methodologies very well. Use case testings where you have people with disabilities actually go and try to use the case or use the, the website. In my opinion, I think the standard is usable. Um, we also think that under our precedent, um, you know, the Chapman Pier 1 case, that a person with a disability actually has to encounter a barrier that relates to their disability to confer standing to be able to prosecute a, an injunctive case uh, under the Ninth Circuit, meaning that there, there actually has to be some type of barrier to access that exists on the website, even if it may be a, tactic, a technical nonconformity with WCAC. Keep in mind, there's A, AA, and AAA levels of conformity to WCAG. And what, I, what I'll see a lot of people do, or a lot of uh, pro web programmers do, is they'll just take back all the functionality off of a website. And they'll say, okay, now it conforms. Now we pass the, the, the automated test because there's nothing left. It's just basically a, you know, a website with a bunch of text. And then when we're done with the website or dispute, we'll turn, we'll turn the switch back on. That's not really a WCAG conformity. Um, so, uh, so we definitely, um, we definitely see that. Um, the, uh, the next slide here is we're going to talk, oh, actually, Azar, before I move on to the next slide, do you have any comments about that? No, I, I think you uh, covered all the points. Okay, I apologize. Trying to move quickly, everybody. I apologize if I'm speaking too quickly. We're just trying to make sure we hit the, the timing deadlines here. So, so the website accessibility, um, you know, what these, what the, these cases talk about, is there was a series of constitutional challenges um, to 
requiring people to comply with standards that are not formally adopted. I mean, think about the due process component. Here I am, I'm a defendant. I go to my lawyer and say, what's the law on this? And the lawyer says, well, there is no law. Uh, there is no clear guidelines and, um, and, uh, and regulations that you're supposed to comply with. And then you get sued over not complying with these guidelines that the Justice Department didn't adopt. So that's a challenge. That's a due process challenge. Some courts a bit at the lower level, trial court level, just to get flipped up above. Justice has said, look, it, you know, um, we, we like ju justice for framed Department of Justice says we like the WCAG. It's the best guidelines that, you know, that exist out there. They're, you know, they're, they're pretty well known. They've been around forever. Um, you know, we expect you to conform to it. Uh, keep in mind, they do it. They do evolve as time goes on as well. Right. We're on 2.1 right now, you know, version 2.1, but there have been prior versions of it. Uh, but uh, as, as for, for the most part, I mean, I've had judges tell my opposing counsel, you mean to tell me that you're asking these people to comply with something that's not the law. But that goes back to the prior discussion that we had about that catch all. You know, the, where a, a public accommodation needs to modify its policies, practices, and procedures so as to afford full and equal access. And that's often what we see as one of the many templates that gets applied. Azar, do you have comments on that? Um, no. Okay. Well, just before I moved on, just didn't want to cut you off. Um, so, all right. So, uh, speaking of policies, so we talk about how policies. We, how policies uh, are required. And this is, this is not just to satisfy the requirement of, uh, of what the laws are, this is to protect a, a public accommodation from being sued. Um, one of the things that we see in a lot of the Department of Justice consent decrees is a focus on uh, an infrastructure to make sure that a website, which is usually updated daily, not only stays compliant today, but it's compliant tomorrow and the next day and next month. And so how do you do that? You create an infrastructure. You create an infrastructure that's gonna promote accessibility. And um, so often when I craft uh, website accessibility policies or any type of policies, I do a lot of policies on every context uh, of uh, public accommodations operations. And what we, we do is we look to what justice is asking. I'll also talk, I'll call up Azar. I'll talk to other people. I'll say, what is, what are the issues on your radar? What is going on in the plaintiff's world? What are people's concerns? Often we will have, uh, you know, if it's a larger uh, uh, public accommodation, we'll do outreach to some of the uh, advocacy groups. We want to know what people care about and make sure it's part of our policies. So the first thing is we want to have a formal policy. Uh, you know, you can see, you know, all the access portions of it, but you want a formal policy that's in writing, you want to train off of it. So people know about it, you want to make sure that it resides in a place that employees can see and know about, you also want to make sure that to the extent that there's a, that the public is going to be taking advantage and availing themselves of this policy, that there is a, it's publicly available, it's on your website, it's posted somewhere, so they know, look, <clears throat> You know, this is their commitment. This is what, this is how we handle it. If we have an issue with your website, I can contact your accessibility coordinator and I can make that type of accommodation request. So we want to have a dedicated channel on that. Now, the key about those accessibility channels, the channels where people can communicate to your, your client problems with their websites, problems with their policies, problems that, you know, that just may, like I said, they may creep up. They may be a, uh, a facially neutral policy that has an unintended consequence of having a, a discriminatory impact. You want that and you're going to trace that and record that because in addition to giving you some feedback on what to fix and what to roll into the next time you revise your website or your public accommodation, it's also going to give you something else. It's going to give you a record to prove a negative. If justice ever knocks on your door or plaintiff ever comes along and says, hey, look, you, you know, your website is really bad or your policies are really bad and we know it and we should be able to get the injunction against you even though your website's fixed today because we know it's going to revert back into a bad website um, you can bring up this data that says look we have uh, a communication channel it's open 24 7 for email we have you know same you know same hours as a regular customer service people can contact us through through uh, these these channels and we can make the 
uh, they can make their requests. Uh, and we have, we track all those, we escalate them, and we don't have any records of any complaints about this feature. So that, that's something that's helpful. Zara, do you have any comments? Uh, no. Okay, all right. So I'll just move on to the next slide. <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure I'll probably get some comments from Azar on this one. So um, the anatomy of an ADA claim. So the first thing that, at least in my humble opinion, which makes an ADA claim uh, over a website so prominent, so common, is it's easy to file. So if I were a plaintiff's attorney or a plaintiff, and I wanted to sue over a public accommodation, you know, let's say a, a restaurant, I'm probably going to one restaurant a day for dinner, right? I'm probably not, most people are not hitting two or three restaurants a day for dinner. So you're going to encounter one restaurant. If you have problems and you file a lawsuit over or you do a demand letter or whatever. A website, how many hundreds of websites do a lot of people hit a day? I mean, you're clicking, it's going through. And if you want, and if you want to test a website and do your due diligence as a plaintiff's attorney, you can just run an automated test often, which is free. We talked about the use case for automated testing. There's a lot of tools out there, the WAVE, uh, the WebAIM WAVE tool, uh, uh, a remedial access vendor called DayQ has a, a web a Chrome plugin called Axe AXE, which I like. There's a lot of different tools out there that people can test for free. Compare that to a physical access case where I, if I'm a plaintiff's attorney, I'm probably gonna have to send somebody out to take some measurements. Otherwise, I'm filing a, a lawsuit over a facility, you know, that that may be compliant. Whereas this, you you can very quickly validate claims. Uh, you can often see uh, <clears throat> an entire enterprise being targeted. And so if you have one company with multiple brands, you'll often have one back house development team or one set of, of third party uh, development contractors they work with. What we do find is historically most development teams lack the capacity to achieve website conformity with WCAG. That's changing. We're seeing that we're seeing that change. Um, we're seeing more and more people being trained, at, at, you know, in, um, in in website accessibility for website development, which is which is a very positive uh, issue. And again, as the plaintiff, you know, you know, devil's advocate, plaintiff's bar side here is that's what that's what their lawsuits were intended to achieve. Um, that's what a, a plaintiff's attorney would say, of course. A defense attorney would say um, this was going to happen anyway. Uh, <clears throat> you know, as we know, uh, we talked about the damage claims, which do incentivize it. But something else that that you see here: holiday code locks. So, what does that mean? So, let's just say you work for a retailer. That's your client. Often, we'll find that during the holiday season, where they have their high volume of uh, sales, they have a code lock, meaning they're not going to be able to fix their websites. Not going to be able to make any changes during the holiday season. Because the fact is, is that's the revenue. They do not want to risk breaking that website. So that's an issue. We, uh, we also see for uh, the anatomy of a website access claim, we do see a lot of people who use third-party content on their websites. That can be an area of problems. If you have somebody else's uh, content embedded into your website and you, and you have embedded that content for access, that can give rise to problems, and we often get suits over that. Usually, you know, we we'll see it in payment processing, things like that. And then finally, the remedial access vendors, which I think uh, we'll talk about in a little bit. They're they're specialists, just like any other expert you would hire in a lawsuit. But these are specialists who come in and help your client fix their websites. They had a much larger role in the past than they do go in the future, because development teams historically did not have the ability to go in and fix these things themselves. But now we're seeing that change as time goes by. So is our? Yeah, just to chime in, in terms of the prosecution of these cases. One thing that Matt mentioned that's very important is the websites are always changing. And so if you are representing a client who has indicated the website was not accessible at a certain point in time, um, if you're just relying on a free software or an automated testing of the website, that uh, may very well not be sufficient to prosecute your claims. Because um, what happens after 
you know, you've notified a defendant and certain changes have been made to the website. How are you going to actually preserve evidence pertaining to your claims, evidence pertaining to the state of the website that has now, since you've notified the defendant, um, been changed and remedied or changed and still not accessible, but a different website. Um, so those are very important uh, considerations for plaintiff's counsel um, to always make sure that the websites are preserved in whatever state um, you know, you're, or whatever time frame you're alleging. It's very difficult to actually maintain sufficient records of a website without using a professional software or web preservation software that allows you to basically interact with a website um, as it existed at a certain point in time. And that evidence is crucial because later on, if uh, you know, defendant does argue that the website has undergone changes and has been remedied, you can always go back to the state of the website as it existed and also verify the various um, versions that have since been implemented. Um, so by way of you know, prosecuting these cases, while it's really easy to make these claims, um, I think in terms of the evidence that's needed to try a case to trial, um, it's a completely different uh, end game. And you need to have both the software to preserve the website, as well as more than just an automated software um, that checks for you know, sort of the bigger level issues. Um, so that's just my point of view from the plaintiff's perspective. So uh, there's a, a quick chat uh, question. So uh, that, that's germane to this. Uh, Azar, do you have a, uh, an example of such preservation technology? Yeah, um, there are a variety of companies that offer services pertaining to the preservation of websites. And typically, these companies are used by defendants um, who want to preserve uh, the data um, and their, their websites for a variety of reasons. But these companies are now also offering the services to plaintiff's counsel who need to preserve third party content um, without you know, being uh, the authors of that content. Um, there are companies like Web Freezer and um, Page Recorder. Um, those are two companies that I know of. Um, and they provide on a subscription uh, monthly level uh, certain services to preserve the websites. Now, if you're trying to preserve the entire content of a website so that you can actually interact with it, um, just as you would if it were still live, then that obviously requires further resources. Um, but yeah, there are some very uh, developed uh, uh, software out there that you can utilize to preserve websites and they're done on a subscription model. Great. So jump real quickly into communicative access. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we come across on websites is um, you'll have video content, video content with an audio component. And there's a, there's a series of litigations uh, that prosecute claims based just on this. So when we see 1.2.2, that's talking about the WCAG, there's a section in there that says, look, if you have pre-recorded audio content, um, you're supposed to have captioning. Um, and the captioning, of course, is so that somebody who is deaf or has a hearing impairment can follow what's going on on that, on that video content. <clears throat> there is, of course, the exception. And the exception is, is look, if that, if that information is already on the website in text version, then you don't need to have it there. Um, but so we definitely come across people who sue over that. Uh, it's something to note. Um, you could definitely find yourself getting in trouble if you have often video contents, third-party content. Um, we have a comment here, of course, from the WCAG that says, look, if you don't have audio, you can just say no. You put a caption that says, look, no, no sound is used in this clip. Um, this, again, circles back to that effective communication standard that we were talking about earlier uh, through uh, auxiliary aids and services, because remember, the WCAG is not the, you know, the, the legal standard. 
Um, there is also a different set of standards for live content because obviously live captioning is more difficult. But we do see these lawsuits. Uh, they do come down um, in New York. They're, they're pretty common. Um, and I have seen them in California as well. And this is just a, uh, you know, a captioning. We had a whole series of, of captioning lawsuits that uh, were filed by one particular plaintiff's group against medical professionals in Southern California. So it is a, it is a common issue to, uh, to address. Is there any comments? Um, one thing that comes up as well on the plaintiff side is sometimes the content or the video that you're referring to is third party content. And so um, you have a defendant that actually doesn't have control over um, the way that content is presented. And so that also leads to trying to think about, you know, a out of, outside of the box kind of solution in terms of here you have a defendant that's utilizing content from a third party um, source um, and yet they don't have the control to make that content accessible. And that's where um, you have to think about solutions, namely the removal of the content, or if they are going to include the content, there needs to be some kind of overriding um, uh, and, and ensuring accessibility. Yeah, alternative communication methods. One of the things that, that uh, I do a lot of is I do work on third-party content procurement guidelines and contracts. And <clears throat> what you're gonna find, of course, is that the third-party content, you know, just like any type of digital asset, they're going to disclaim all liability they're, or limit it to the amount of the contract. You know, and they're not a public accommodation, so they can't get sued. You're the public accommodation. You're the one that gets sued. So when, when I do those, uh, those, those contracts, what I'll usually do is I will, I will draft them in a way that requires some, some testing, some reps and warranties, all kinds of shifting of liability. But the best practice, if you really want to ensure liability, I not just strike that if you really want to ensure compliance and mitigate liability is that you test it yourself, uh, you know, as opposed to having some vendor rep and warn to you that their content, you know, conforms to WCAG, test it yourself, obviously test it, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a pilot environment that's not live, put it in, see how it works on your template. Um, but we definitely run across that a lot. Um, changing gears. This is another area of, of, of litigation that we see a lot of, um, and uh, it may go away depending on the Court of Appeal rules, but we see a, um, a lot of litigation over reservation systems. So what it is, is <clears throat> we, 28 CFR 36302 subdivision E sets forth a series of, of, of uh, requirements relating to how a hotel or a or a, you know, a, a, a lodging facility should make its reservation systems available to third parties. You often find people making reservations online, right? That's where you book your hotel before you go. So one of the big concerns is, is, hey, how do I, I'm a person with a physical disability. I'm using your hotel website. How do I know when I get there, I'm actually gonna be able to use your hotel. How am I going to, you know, and obviously I want to make sure I get an accessible room. I need to know the features. I have a bed lift for my wheelchair. Is that going to work in your room? I need to use a desk. Is your desk going to be the right height? Because even though we look at a lot of people think of disabilities as in one category, each person has unique needs. Everybody is unique. We know that it's, it's, you know, it's just who humans are. So they need to know that. And that's what, that's what the reservation systems are about. And we see this. Um, Zari, you have any comments on that before I move on? No, no, okay. not one. Okay. So what we see though, is there's, there've been a ton of litigation over this. And we know that back in September 15, 2010, uh, the DOJ issued a, uh, a set of guidance on this. And they say for hotels built in compliance with 1991 ADAG, that's the Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, that's the regulations pertaining to physical access. You can just say the hotel is accessible and then describe the room type, the size and number of the beds, the type of accessibility bathing or accessible bathing facility. You know, you have a roll-in shower. Do you have an open door tub? What do you have? And what type of communicative features you have in the room? For, for obviously somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing, do you have a, you know, a doorbell that lights up? 
you know, because so, they're not going to hear when somebody knocks on the door. Do you have alarms, other visual notifications? Do the lights blink when the phone rings? Things like that. Usually it's a kit that people buy and use in their room, but uh, or, or the hotel buys, obviously it provides. Uh, but so that's the, that's the guidance from the DOJ. Is there any comments on that before we move on? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so we look at, we look at one case in particular, Garcia versus Best Western Norwalk. And we see Central District, pretty recent, right? And this was the actual, uh, this was the actual features that were listed on the website. And the court said, "Hey, wait a second, uh, this is compliant. This is fine. You've met the DOJ standards." And then we look at, uh, we see a little bit later case in September of 2021 um, in the Eastern District of California. We see that there's a footnote that summarizes 70 plus cases in which district courts in California have granted motions dismissed based upon the DOJ guidance. So these lawsuits are still being prosecuted, but now they're being prosecuted in state court. They've, they've stopped filing them in federal court because we see how it's received. Uh, there are three appeals, there were four, one settled. So there's three pending appeals of these issues going on right now. Generally speaking, what's gonna happen is if your client gets sued over this, you'll probably wanna either settle or you make a motion to dismiss or have the case stayed. A lot of people will have the case stayed, but you know, of course that assumes that your, web, your client's website complies with the 2010 uh, guidance. What you'll find though, is that most hotel operators, they do usually, especially the ones that are franchises, the, the, the licensor, they've already adopted and figured out what is required to conform with the, uh, with the DOJ uh, guidance. And what they'll do is they'll give a questionnaire to the hotel operator, they fill it out. And then what the, then the licensor, which operates the master website, will, uh, will put those features on so that you can comply with, uh, with the DOJ uh, standards. Because otherwise it is kind of a catch 22 because if you were to list every single dimension in your hotel, uh, which obviously is not required, but if you were to do that, then two things are gonna happen. First of all, nobody's gonna be able to use it. Drinking out of a fire hose, how's somebody gonna figure out when you know when they say you know a certain measurement or cross slope or whatever they seem to know whether it's accessible. But second of all, no hotel is perfect. Conditions are changing. You're either going to have inaccurate information on the website, uh, or you're going to reveal some type of uh, you're going to reveal some type of barrier, which would in it, in and of itself create a lawsuit. That's why people, I think, have tried to make these lawsuits uh, so common, as a, from a plaintiff's perspective, because it's a very difficult. Um, law to navigate that's why the justice uh, guidelines i think are the most practical solution to it any comments on that azar uh yeah well you did mention that some you know are adopting the reservation systems online uh that are uh accessible but that doesn't always translate into uh the same reservation system if it's accessed uh, through a cell phone uh, using a mobile app. Um, again, that's something to consider. Um, while a feature may be deemed accessible or um, viewed as accessible using a website, um, that doesn't always translate in the same experience if somebody's using an actual uh, mobile app, which is more often than not the way that people try to access websites these days. Absolutely, absolutely. We do see a truncated version of information listed on that, as well as third-party apps as well, such as Expedia. So let's move on. Um, so this is going to be emerging trends. We promise to wrap up soon, folks. So, yeah, uh, and I apologize for us going a little over. Um, I'm going to try to talk about this as efficiently as possible. Um, so there are some topics that have come up. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the pandemic started, businesses have been forced to make a ton of changes to their practices. Uh, this includes the implementation of uh, self-serve kiosks, um, self-checkout lines, having curbside pickups, as well as changes to the actual interior of their businesses to just allow social distancing. Um, and given the way that the pandemic is going, unfortunately, it appears that some of these changes are here to stay. 
Um, and so it's vital that businesses consider um, how these changes are impacting um, everyone's experience, including the uh, disabled community's experience. Um, for example, we've talked about this over and over during the presentation about um, the fact that there's an effective communication prong, um, but how does that apply if uh, businesses and customers now have to comply with face masks? Um, as a result of the mandates um, that have been implemented. Um, so the ADA requires that a place of public accommodation effectively, effectively communicates with persons with disabilities. Um, and now you have uh, the masks that are mandated. Um, but the good news is that there's always solutions um, and many of these solutions are not that difficult to implement, especially from a plaintiff side, uh, uh, speaking from a plaintiff side. Um, for example, we can think about clear masks or masks where the lip region is visible as alternatives that can be used so that individuals who rely on um, being able to uh, visually see um, communication can, can actually, uh, you know, be attended to. Um, similarly, the increase in the use of self-service kiosks um, and the decrease in staffing levels can also create barriers for individuals needing special assistance. Um, again, for bigger businesses, uh, it, it makes sense to have someone on hand during every shift uh, that can help assist on a one-on-one -one, one -on -one basis, the individual that has a disability and that needs. Um, that personal um, guidance and assistance. Um, so those are things to consider. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so kiosks have absolutely been around for a long time and we've had a, it's a convergence of issues. You know, I've audited them nationally. It's a real challenge because you have every issue that could exist in a kiosk. You have visual and hearing access, right? Um, you have privacy laws. You have state-specific laws can be more uh, can be more strict. By way of example, California's the building code require you know talks about um, you know the angle of certain screens. Uh, there's a big controversy as well as to whether or not a kiosk switches over into being an ATM um, because if it's an ATM, then you know there's a whole bunch of other regulations that go in um, for the you know. Uh, keep in mind for all the issues of services that the, you know, the affirmative defenses, you know, which come into place, of course, undue burden, you have to provide something that's going to be undue burden, undue burden takes into consideration safety and security. And then there's a the direct threat exemption to the ADA. <clears throat> so if, if, so if providing a certain service would present a, a, an immediate, a real, a cognizable danger to either the person, the guest who's requesting the accommodation or to the person or the people who are surrounding them at the public accommodation, including employees and staff, then that is a basis to deny the requested accommodation. That's the direct threat exemption. A lot of litigation on it. Very rarely has that actually been successfully deployed as a defense because it's so hard to show that there is a, um, that there is a, a legitimate direct threat. However, the pandemic, um, has actually given rise to that. Um, and I, with that, I'll give it to Azar for the next slide. Yeah, that's a great point, Matt. Um, and and we're, we're gonna discuss some of that litigation that's come up. Um, so similarly with curbside pickup, um, that's a great option. And I think it's an option that's going to stay. It's just made everything so easy for everyone. But again, in implementing this option, businesses have to be mindful that they're not taking away, for example, spots reserves, reserved for individuals with disabilities. Um, so these are just some of the issues that businesses have to consider to ensure equal access to their business um, in this new environment. Um, and obviously it's an evolving area of the law and um, new cases that are coming out every single day. Um, one area that we've seen is actually um, lawsuits that involve plaintiffs um, who claim that they're in, unable to comply with the mask mandates due to the disability. Um, a, as you all know, most states and localities have some type of mandate in place. Um, but because there is no federal guidance on the ability of businesses to exclude persons with disabilities for refusing to wear masks, 
we are seeing some novel issues being litigated. Um, of course, the results of the cases are going to be uh, determined given the context um, and the facts and uh, also a major factor that we've seen come into play is really the proof of the disability and the claim of disability. Um, just two very quick examples of cases that um, where, where plaintiffs have litigated the mask mandate claiming the disability. There's the Emanuel versus Walt Disney case where a plaintiff alleged um, that Disney was wrong for denying entry to a seven-year-old who was extremely sensitive to the touch and particularly to his face and um, had a documented um, disability over the course of his life and as such claimed that he couldn't wear the mask. Um, it's interesting that in this case, Disney filed the motion to dismiss, but the district uh, judge denied it. Um, so this case is moving forward. And if it doesn't settle, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, but this is a case where the disability um, appeared to be significant and there was evidence of its nature and scope. Um, so the claims weren't readily dismissed. Um, on the other side, another case that we've seen pop up is the Lewis versus Walmart. It's a group of cases where there were several plaintiffs who were asserting that they were denied access to various stores, including Walmart, Wal uh, Walgreens, and the likes, for refusing to wear masks on the basis of uh, their disability. Now, the claim for disability in those cases were a little bit more nuanced, I want to say. Um, and But the plaintiffs were claiming that there was a local COVID ordinance uh, with a disability exception, and they should have qualified under that exception. Um, the judge in that group of cases granted all the motions to dismiss, finding that the plaintiffs lacked standing based on their failure to allege any injury. Um, the court also held, and this was interesting, that there was no intentional discrimination because an isolated act of negligence uh, is not covered by the ADA. So the judge really viewed the refusal to allow them entry um, when they were claiming uh, the exception, the local ordinance exception applied as an act of negligence. Um, so that obviously is in contrast to the Walt Disney case. But I think again, a uh, factor that has significant weight is the nature and scope of the disability and the proof um, that you, you show of that disability. Um, so we're gonna see where these uh, mask mandate cases take us and how they apply to website accessibility cases as well in terms of the findings. Yeah, absolutely. Disney has been the subject of a lot of litigation over the years over access. Uh, May I bunch in Florida, which they <clears throat> they successfully defended, saying it was going to be a fundamental fundamental alteration of their policies, practices, and procedures to alter their disability access plan. But you know they had a program which they did they voluntarily changed anyway this year, and they addressed most people's concerns. But that was an ongoing lawsuit from a series of lawsuits, um, and they fought that. Uh, but the inability to wear a mask is a, is a real issue for a lot of people um, with real disabilities. And, uh, you know, it creates none of these challenges. Again, <clears throat> you, know, you have to weigh, you know, the, that person's right to participate, you know, and go see, you know, Mickey Mouse, which is obviously a very important thing, especially for a seven-year-old. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I know how much my kids enjoy Disney. And uh, you know, we haven't been able to be there for several years because of the mask mandate. And, um, and the inability to wear a mask is real. And so, um, you know, it, it's just the way it is. You have to weigh the rights and the, the needs of that individual to go to the place versus the danger of exposing that person to, you know, you know to COVID or other people to COVID, uh, which is just a, a very real issue as well. Um, something which, of course, I'm not qualified to speak on, but I can definitely flag the issue. Uh, <clears throat> so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so another emerging trend that we've seen uh, is the increase in e-commerce sales. Um, so a lot of businesses are now exclusively online without any physical locations. We saw this prior to COVID with the closure of malls and stores, um, but it's even more real now in a post-COVID world. Um, so this raises the question, and I think Matt discussed it a little bit earlier in the presentation as to you know, the extent that a website alone without any ties to a brick and mortar uh, location 
um, is that actually covered uh, under the ADA? So is that deemed a place of public accommodation? And as we've mentioned, it's an area of the law where the federal circuits um, largely disagree in, in terms of their answer to this question, and it keeps on evolving. Um, federal circuit courts, uh, the Third circuit, circuit, and as of 2021, the Eleventh Circuit, um, have actually held that the ADA does not apply to websites alone because it there needs to be the physical space prong um, in terms of that calculus. Um, the second, the, the first, second, and seventh circuits, on the other hand, have held that websites alone are places of public accommodation under the ADA. Um, given the prevalence of online commerce. Um, and then you have the Ninth Circuit as well as the Sixth Circuit, and they've taken a more nuanced view, holding that websites are covered by the ADA where there's a nexus uh, between the website and a physical place of public accommodation. Um, so the whole question becomes, what does this nexus really entail? Um, and how closely tied does the physical place of public accommodation need to be? Matt? Yeah, yeah. So there was a question about whether a law firm constitutes a place of public accommodation under the ADA. And I think this, this slide kind of covers that. Um, you know, when you say about the nexus, you know, does it show the locations? People find locations about the website, uh, about the public accommodation. Uh, so by way of example, can I figure out where I can find the local uh, retail uh, outlet of your, of your company? Or is there other coupons available that I can find online, like in the Target case, that I could take in to the web, into the physical store and use it? That type of issues. Uh, I will say from a defense perspective, for most, more often than not, this is really not the battleground you're going to win on. Um, I definitely, you know, in the Second Circuit, you know, we'll see the Southern District of New York and Eastern District of New York. We see a lot of ADA cases. Um, you know, the, the, it's mixed uh, precedent. Courts are probably not going to kick out a, a case uh, not being a public accommodation. Um, Ninth Circuit as well. We rarely see that. Eleventh Circuit, we used to see a lot. You know, that's Florida. We used to see a lot of of website access cases. And then we've had a, a change in the precedent. We talked about Third Circuit uh, earlier. Third Circuit, you know, it's the, the, the you know, the, the case is about, a, is a, you know, really deals with a, uh, uh, an insurance policy. <clears throat> yeah, if you go to uh, Pittsburgh, uh, you know, district court, um, and anybody knows who I'm talking about, there's a series of plaintiffs who file there, um, you know, 10 times out of 10, it's a public accommodation. It's a very plainest favorable uh, uh, jurisdiction. Absolutely. So again, I, I don't know if this would be, uh, you know, the for most cases, this would be the uh, the battlefield that I think you're going to win the case on. There's a lot of other things to win the case on. That's probably not the one you're going to win on. Yeah. And uh, discussing the next slide, um, there's also a lot of unknown as to what Nexus actually entails in California. Can an e-commerce business that's selling its goods through retailers that it doesn't own or control or operate, is that subject to the ADA? Is that an excess, even though it's a place of public accommodation that it doesn't operate or own directly? Um, what about an e-commerce business that sells its goods online but um, and doesn't have any retailers that sells those goods but has a corporate office? So there's a lot of arguments that you can raise. Um, and Again, as Matt has alluded to, I think uh, a lot of courts in California uh, have a very nuanced approach, and some courts have said, yes, the ADA could apply to websites alone, while others um, have uh, decided otherwise. The courts of appeal have largely opted to deliberately not really deal with this issue directly. Um, uh, the next slide. Okay. With uh, the new administration, we have noted that the DOJ is once again getting involved in uh, the enforcement of Title III actions. This is a departure from the last administration um, that was pretty much uninvolved. Um, and this signals the fact that accessibility, um, including website accessibility specifically, um, should remain an important consideration for businesses. Um, there is an obligation and the new administration is clearly signaling that. 
Um, the administration also expressly found, um, and this was interesting, that long COVID, so having symptoms of COVID um, lasting uh, for a matter of weeks to months, can be considered a disability under certain circumstances. So that again validates the experience of a significant portion of the population that you know may not have had a disability before the pandemic, but that are now dealing with ongoing health issues. Um, one aspect that we've seen rise uh, is also the private enforcement of claims against law firms and their websites. So as Matt alluded to, um, law firms provide a service. Um, they have an online presence and more often than not, they also have offices, so brick and mortar locations. Um, and we have seen some law firms uh, you know, that are being hit with lawsuits about not having accessible websites. And unfortunately, um, some law firms and some attorneys are just not as well versed about this requirement as other businesses or other service providers, um, given that this is a pretty recent development. Um, they have a significant online presence, and yet um, there isn't as much consideration about you know, the accessibility um, of the website and their obligations. Um, so as mentioned, we've seen lawsuits filed against law firms for not uh, providing an equally accessible website. So this is no longer an issue that's only relevant to a law firm's clients. Um, law firms now have to consider this specifically as it pertains to their own website. Um, and as long as the law firm has a website and provides a service, it needs to be aware of this issue. Yeah, absolutely, the old joke was in physical access, was most of the most of the plaintiffs' attorneys' law, uh, offices were not uh, accessible, and a lot of the plaintiffs' attorneys would try to make their offices not public accommodations by saying, "Look, you know, nobody can come here. We don't take members of the public," and they try to to avoid the issue. Uh, but certainly, with websites, as we know, it's a, a universal issue. So <clears throat> now we've presented you guys with a lot of problems and you know with issues to look out for and how website accessibility is very nuanced and not as simple as it seems uh, so you're, you're wondering what the solution is um, there's a variety of options out there um, again some drawbacks uh, pertaining to each uh, category um, but there are solutions as to how a law firm and their clients can ensure that the websites are accessible um, so Matt alluded to this earlier in the presentation, but there are reputable and uh, accredited remediation vendors. So remediation companies that uh, do this every day, all day, um, they're specialized in making sure that digital content, whether it's websites, uh, mobile apps, or any other type of digital content is presented in a more accessible manner. Um, these vendors usually do take a significant amount of time to uh, improve the accessibility of websites. They also charge a significant amount of money um, to do this type of work. Um, and most of the times, if there are subsequent changes to the content of the website, this requires more work and more money to be spent or at a very minimum, an ongoing engagement by the remediation company which again is quite costly. Um, it also happens that these companies miss the mark in terms of identifying all communication barriers or um, that they're sued, that, that the, company, the, the, the company is sued irrespective of using a vendor. Um, and unless these vendors agree to indemnify um, the client, which uh, based on my experience rarely happens, uh, there's a level of accountability that's missing from the entire calculus. Um, here you are, or here's the client paying a significant sum uh, for this company to do this work. Um, and they give you certain assurances about you know, the work that they've done. And yet you're still being sued. Where do you turn if they've missed the mark or the website is still being sued? Um, and again, there's a void in terms of uh, what to do and where to turn to. Um, 
Now, Matt also discussed the use of accessibility software. I think that's a great option in terms of ensuring ongoing monitoring of a website, especially if it's undergoing a lot of changes and um, updating of content. Um, there are companies that provide pretty advanced software that can audit a website and identify accessibility issues. Um, but again, there's a whole problem of maybe not identifying all the communication barriers, um, it being an automated mechanism versus a manual audit, which you know can, can miss issues. And um, also the software doesn't deal with the remediation portion of it. It helps you identify what some issues are, but what do you do to fix them? Um, so I think this is more of a tool uh, for monitoring once the remediation work has been undertaken. Um, there are some companies out there that are providing these add-ons to the websites um, or mobile apps that are in the form of accessibility widgets or overlays. Um, and these companies are making pretty extraordinary claims about rendering any website accessible quickly and really, really cheaply um, instead of going the traditional route of the remediation company. Um, based on my experience on the plaintiff side, the widgets and overlays can be tricky. In some instances, they may improve the accessibility of a website, but in other instances, um, they can actually make it worse. So the companies, uh, and these companies rely on a subscription model. So you pay per month to have access to this code um, and for this add-on to the website. Um, I, I believe they are oversimplifying the requirements for accessibility. So a lot of times uh, what is promised in terms of the actual uh, experience that our screen reader user will have is not <laughs> what's uh, obtained. Um, and I think the old saying, if it sounds too good to be true, applies here. Um, but again, this is from the plaintiff uh, side of things. Um, and, and it should be noted though, that there has been a lot of critique from disability groups and advocates, as well as experts in the remediation field about the use of widgets and overlays. So it's not just, you know, uh, the plaintiff's bar that's saying this, um, but there is an oversimplification about um, accessibility. Um, one final solution that's come to light, and I'll let Matt uh, talk about this a little bit more because he's definitely better versed being on the defense side, um, is the actual coverage, insurance coverage of website accessibility claims up to a certain amount. Um, in the past, uh, there were instances that some insurance companies you know, would um, agree to coverage under certain circumstances, but we're now seeing an actual policy that's drafted with website accessibility in mind. And it specifically covers that business uh, transaction. So this seems to me like a very, very good solution, especially for a defendant or a client that has um, a lot of digital content and digital content that needs to be updated and modified all the time and where the digital content is also very complicated um, in terms of the features and programs that are offered. Um, I think that would be, that this is a great solution. I'll let Matt chime in. Yeah, yeah, great. So uh, go down the list of the topics. Uh, the first one for uh, remedial access vendors, Look, I've relied on them so many times over the last 20 years. And we've, you know, I've worked with them so much and they're great. Uh, but the problem is, is it's not a one size fits all. They're consultants. You have to use them judiciously. They're, they can be very expensive, a lot more expensive than a law firm. They're not going to develop their content. They're going to tell you what's wrong with it and help you figure out how to fix it. So you got to make sure you work with your remedial team to do it. Smaller businesses often don't have that type of resources or team. So you're going to find yourself working with, uh, you're going to find yourself working with third-party developers. So they may not be a, a one size fits all. Those overlays, uh, wow, um, where do I start? So if you look at the, the, the I mean, 
uh, Azar, you know, you're, you're, you're very diplomatic on this. <laughs> I, I can just say this. If you look at some of the claims that these guys give on their websites, I, I you know, you are, you know, you're going to not only get an overlay, you're going to get the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, you know, and probably cure cancer at the same time. They tell you unequivocally that if you pay them their money, you will never be sued again. And if you ever get sued, they're going to stand right by your side. Well, I will tell you that I've, look, I, I handle website accessibility across the country. I speak with plaintiff's attorneys all day long. And, and I, I know of a lot of plaintiff's attorneys who exclusively target websites that use the overlays. And the reason being is because they do create problems and they create more. And these companies that are selling these, these packages of goods they're, they give people a false sense of security, so they spend their money, and it's you know they say it's forty nine dollars whatever month. It's not. There's an upfront engineering fee of a couple grand or more sometimes, and then you pay all this other amount of money. And these companies are definitely in the heart of controversy. I think if you buy it as your you know, or have your client buy it, they are guaranteeing they're going to get sued because people are running around trying to do it. And you got to think about it from a plaintiff's perspective is if people really could fix these problems for 40 bucks a month, then the plaintiff's attorneys are gonna have to find somebody else to sue over something else, right? So they cannot tolerate uh, this type of product being out there, especially if it's got problems with it. And uh, you know, the, the overlays, they, they really do have a lot of problems. Um, you know, not that, they, not that they all don't work, but the, I, the promises they make to the clients. It'd be one thing if they would just say on the website, look, it's better than nothing. You probably still get sued. If you do, you're on your own. But that's not what they're saying. I mean, it is, you look at the claims, it's pretty remarkable what they, what not all of them, but some of them say about, uh, uh, say about it. And you can look and you can, there's Wikipedia pages and all kinds of materials dedicated to addressing the effectiveness of overlays. Hopefully at some point in time, they will get that technology perfected because that will provide more access. Um, insurance has always been a sticky issue. There's an older case, um, you know, the modern insurance case, what we refer to it, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it basically holds that, uh, that uh, uh, accessibility issue is the result of intentional conduct by making decisions about what to do and what not to do. And so there's no sudden and accidental event or physical injury. So under a standard uh, uh, you know, CGL policy, we don't have a, a triggered loss to, to, be, uh, to be covered. I have gotten EPLI coverage before, um, but obviously under reservation of rights, but that still gives you a defense, even though it doesn't really matter because those are wasting policies. And I have gotten uh, EPLA policies to contribute significant amounts, eight figures in one situation to settle a class action. <clears throat> now the product that Azar is talking about, I've spoken with the brokerage before. It was like a Lloyd's policy that they were putting together. Um, <clears throat> they were, you, you, you pay into it. So it's, you know, it's a custom pro product. And they would give you, uh, you know, like a hundred thousand uh, dollars, you know, of wasting, you know, limits for uh, defense and indemnity in the event that you're sued over website access. Um, I have not seen that product go live yet. I talked to them when they were we were putting it together, but nevertheless, uh, you know, that would be something to consider. Uh, you know, business decision, cost benefit. We all know that just because you have insurance coverage, that's not the end of it. A lot of people have problems with their insurance carriers. A lot of insurance carriers have their own agendas. So there's, you know, there's always a lot of, uh, you know, in, insured versus insurer, um, uh, you know, disputes as well. Um, and I handle those as well. So I've seen a lot of them over the years. So I definitely don't think that that's going to be the end all solution. Certainly not getting sued is better than getting sued and having insurance. But if that's a product and a way to, to allocate and shift risk, and that can be accomplished. That's great. I have yet to see the final product, uh, but I we're speaking to somebody who's putting that together. And finally, one of the other things to mention is, <clears throat> you know, we heard a lot about the lawsuits. It can't be overstated how many of these lawsuits. At one point, I thought one quarter of the lawsuits filed in the Central District were access lawsuits. That was a, a statistic I read. I think it goes up and down, but the courts are trying to figure out how to deal with it. Uh, with the volume of these lawsuits. We see certain courts doing certain things. 
In Florida, what they've done is the, the district courts themselves, the judges have issued standing orders to try to deal with them. Um, you know, one, one which I was particularly fond of, which the plaintiffs don't like, and, uh, and it was affirmed two times um, by in the 11th Circuit uh, on appeals that I had, um, where uh, basically this judge said, look, if you're a defendant, you go in and you just hold up the white flag. Before you file your answer, you say, look, I agree there are barriers and I'm going to fix it. Then the judge stays the case and uh, gives you a, an OSC date. You come back at a later time to prove that it's been fixed. And then the judge will give the plaintiff reasonable fees for filing the complaint, like 2,500 bucks. Plaintiffs don't like that, obviously. Central District of California, to deal with their overflow of cases, what they've done is they've created a program where the defendant can avail themselves to a stay of the case and a mediation. You know, the panelists are, you know, Central District are some of the top that I've worked with. They're fantastic mediators. They can help you resolve it. If not, what you'll find a lot of times in the Central District, the judges are sua sponte, declining supplemental jurisdiction over the state law claims. And uh, what you can do then as a plaint as a defendant is you can uh, you know attack the you know the standing of the plaintiff, which is either you know standing to return to the website, um, you know, mootness, you know, which is another issue, remediate the website, the case gets dismissed, the plaintiff doesn't get their fees in the state at the federal court, they refile in state court. That said, a lot of plaintiffs have figured that out. And they're just filing in state court. They're just saying, you know what, let's not do it. But those are some of the solutions that we've seen um, you know, over the years uh, develop. Um, certainly, um, you know, because of the uncertainty in these standards, I, I cannot uh, imagine that uh, there's going to be uh, an end to this litigation anytime soon. You know, it's just, it's, it, you know, it's really is an uncertain set of standards and these websites, the technology changes daily. It's going to be very difficult for people to achieve full conformity. Okay. Any uh, closing comments, Azar, or just to thank everybody? Yeah, no, thanks everybody. <laughs> and uh, we have provided you with a lot of material to consider. Um, we appreciate everybody's attention. Yes, thank you again, everybody. We definitely appreciate your time. And we apologize for going over 45 minutes, but this was definitely 10 pounds of flour in a six pound sack. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew and Azar. Everyone have a great week. Thanks. Take care.